Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joanne Tompkins, and welcome to this session on Technologies and Creative Futures, part of the Academy of Humanities Symposium on Australia's Cultural Future. In the opening to this symposium, Mr. Wally Bell generously welcomed us to Ngunnawal land, the land on which the Academy of Humanities is located. I'm on Yagara land in Brisbane, and I acknowledge all elders and custodians of this land and elders and custodians of all the lands on which we are collectively meeting today. Thanks for tuning in. This session is being run in webinar format, which means that only the panelists will be seen on the screen. In this session, each panelist will speak for a maximum of eight minutes. Then I'll raise a few questions and issues that have emerged to generate a discussion between the panelists. And then we'll open it up to questions from the floor, as it were. We invite you to ask questions through the Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can write them whenever you like, and we urge you to write them uh, earlier than later but we won't actually be turning to them until the last section um, of the session. And we'll try to answer as many as possible. If we run out of time, there are two Zoom networking sessions on Tuesday and Thursday, where we can discuss issues that arise in smaller groups and more about those later. Please bear with us if there are any technical glitches. If you encounter any technical difficulties, please contact the Academy via events at humanities.org.au. If a major tech failure happens and cannot be fixed quickly, we will advise all delegates that we will reschedule the session and post the recording on our YouTube channel. <clears throat> you can follow the discussions via Twitter at humanitiesau and hashtag AAH Symposium to the session proper. We began thinking about this symposium well before the effects of the pandemic were clear. We have pivoted, like everybody else has, to some of the issues the arts sector has been dealing with over 2020. The arts sector has always been economically precarious but it has always equally in its different expressions of creativity been fundamental to our culture. A recent report from the Australia Council has found that 98% of Australians had some engagement with the arts in 2019. 2020 turned everything upside down. Many of you will be familiar with the website, I Lost My Gig, which by May recorded the loss of income for Australian artists of more than $340 million. The Impossible Project tracks cancelled works. But there are also suggestions that new forms are being embraced. A study at the University of Exeter suggests that 72% of arts lovers would pay to watch a live Zoom production, and that's after the pandemic is over. Rather than focusing on the losses though, we are interested today in discussing the transformations that we have seen in the creation and expression of the arts in 2020 and beyond. What has emerged from art in lockdown? How has technology helped and hindered artistic production? How have young people responded and how well placed are Indigenous peoples and communities for the production and consumption of art in 2021. Our four speakers come from different angles on this topic and from different art forms. You've received their biographies with the program, so I'll refer you to the program for their full backgrounds. But briefly, Wesley Enoch AM is the Artistic Director of the Sydney Festival. Dr. Wendy Ware is Executive Director, Advocacy and Development at the Australia Council for the Arts. Astrid Jorgensen is founder of the Pub Choir, now the Couch Choir. And Dr. Indigo Holcomb James is from RMIT's School of Media and Communications, where she works on digital participation and museum studies. Wesley, would you like to begin? 
Thanks, Joanne. Uh, I would like to um, add my thanks and hello to everyone. I'm here in Byron Bay on Bunjalung country, and I'm a Kondamooka man from Strabroke Island, Minjitaba, just off the coast of Brisbane. Um, it's interesting that during this pandemic, many of the divides that we've been experiencing as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been exacerbated. So the ideas of those who are geographically um, isolated have become more so. The idea of also the digital divide has become more prominent. Those who have access to the means of production have increased, uh, have been able to maintain their position, but those who don't have access, we find that they are kind of slipping away. And this existing divide has become more and more of a schism. The flip side of that is, and I remember an elder telling me this story, that, um, that every freezer is full, meaning that everyone is fishing, everyone is hunting, and that the idea of cultural transference of knowledge has been occurring during especially this lockdown because kids are off their phones, kids are not going off to um, boarding schools, etc., and that they're involved more and more in the cultural transference of knowledge through this kind of intergenerational conversation. And we're seeing also this idea of pushing away from the idea of um, object and outcome and more towards process. This idea of, yes, carving or painting or even dance, that the idea of the process of learning has become more and more important rather than just the outcome. I mean, this is contradictory a little bit to the points that I'll make later, but from one of the conversations I've been having, this idea that many of our economies are based on objects, on the things to sell, but in fact, the things that are valued within a community, within a cultural community for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is the process and the passing on of knowledge. So that the idea that we become fixated on the economic output, the idea of the object being the, the, the thing to pursue has been shifting along the way. The contradiction to this is the idea of the online portals that we've been seeing, especially for sales, as the Cairns Indigenous Art Fair in particular, and also the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair, how they have moved to an online platform to increase and keep connected to sales as uh, and, and their market as different Aboriginal communities close off to uh, the potential of the pandemic entering their communities. They've also found that economically they've been hit. So we've been seeing these two things, uh, an increase in the idea of making work uh, and dancing and creating uh, cultural objects, but the inability to sell them. And so these online portals have become more and more important and they are clunky at the moment. There doesn't seem to be enough of a, uh, a national or a, a uniform approach to how the marketplace is working for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. In of this ad basis. One of the things that many people are talking about, the Australia Council during this whole period, and I was one of the hosts, have highlighted a, um, a, a round table, a moment when Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people can come together and share ideas. And we did over four months of these round tables, where at times we had over 180 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from around the country, and also uh, First Nations people abroad, sharing ideas and sharing the conversation, which hadn't been happening before. As you can imagine, we are a group of over 600 different languages. And often we're very kind of um, uh, self-managing in the way we work culturally. During the pandemic, the isolation has created more opportunities for conversation and sharing than we'd ever thought possible. So this idea that these sharing um, platforms, especially the Australia Council's roundtable, have created more cross um, pollination, if you like, of ideas around on online sales, about care, about ideas also about digital uh, constructions of um, communications. These kind of connecting works have been important. Um, Rhoda Roberts from the Australia, from sorry, from the Sydney Opera House has talked of the example now to how new technologies have been delivering safe ways of sharing and holding on to culturally significant material. She talks of uh, dance rights, which is one of the uh, live performance activities at the Sydney Opera House and a big dance circle on the forecourt. They have moved online and therefore are sharing um, dances amongst communities 
uh, on an online platform. And she talked of one young elder coming to her saying, look, I'm at the end of my life. I think that I won't be around in a year's time to look at these dancing, uh, to share the dances and that the young people aren't ready to hear the dances I've got to offer. Can I come to you and you record the story and the dances so that we can access this later? There's a fantastic project in, um, in Yirikala called the Mulka Project, which is in fact, uh, it goes back almost a century now of visual and uh, moving images of their people. And it's all kind of uh, correlated and connected uh, as a way of um, families staying connected to dances and cultural materials from either a hundred years ago to you know the 21st birthday party last week. And there's a sense now that the digital technologies are becoming the safe place to house our stories and our digital dancing. It's a safe place to be because in many ways, our digital technologies uh, are still in our hands as we own more and more the means of production. And communities have been coming together more and more as they kind of upskill in terms of, uh, um, well, even these platforms now, old aunties who are FaceTiming with their families, this notion of Zoom meetings across the country, uh, conferences that are happening more readily so that mobility is no longer an issue here. As you can experience, and as everyone will talk about, during this pandemic, the digital technologies have allowed us in, in ways removed some of the barriers of participation. So time, geography, disability, cost and cultural differences have sometimes melted away in the face of these digital technologies, their engagement. And this makes it even more important to come back to the initial idea. When we have access to these digital technologies, we can innovate. If we don't have access, we find ourselves increasingly more isolated and unable to pass on to the next generation certain stories. There does need to be a focus on young people going forward. I think that the pandemic has been fantastic and the social ruptures have been interesting because they've also brought certain values to the fore. One of the things that I worry about is that one of the values I'm seeing is a conservatism and a sense of precedent going back to what has worked in the past rather than holding on to the idea of progress that uh, Indigenous people, First Nations people may be lost in, the, in translation as we go forward because economic imperatives will hold uh, more sway than the idea that we need to increase participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That digital technologies are allowing us to innovate and create new ways of engagement. But in fact, I'm worried that economic imperatives are going to stop us from having access to these sources of, of income given the economic crises we're about to, to, to face. So in the end, I just saying this idea of the process, the idea of making, the idea of sharing being more important than the economic in outcome is what we're seeing across the board now. And what I, I take a, a leaf out of the, our federal government's book where money is almost worthless at the moment it just goes around to make sure you can protect community and people to put health and community at the fore. And that that's what I think is a very First Nations perspective and that we should continue these kind of ideas. That's, that's my little rant there, Joanne, just as a kind of sense of what it means for us as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Thank you, Wesley. That raises a lot of really interesting things and a few contradictions, which is always nice as well. Um, let's move to Wendy. Thank you, Joanne. I'm just sharing my screen because that's more interesting to look at than me, I think. Um, I'm speaking to you all from Wongal country on the Aora Nation land that's been home to culture and creativity for over 70,000 years. And I acknowledge the traditional custodians, elders past and present, and any First Nations people who are here with us today, and especially you, Wesley. Um, I may echo some of your words because I think we have a certain amount of simpatico 
Um, I'm going to take a bit more of a generalist perspective. I think for some time, many of us in the cultural sector have known that our business models needed innovating. And I'm reminded of a conversation that I had a couple of years ago with US cultural thinker, Stephen A. Wolf, who some of you might know. And he told me that when it, when it comes to performing arts companies, we've got 19th century art forms, we've got 20th century business models and 21st century people, and that's a problem. And that's, of course, a generalisation, but it does hold true for large swathes of the cultural sector. So the call to innovate business models is far from new. The call to embed digital as core is also not new. And I think over the years, many in our sector have dipped their toes into digital only to retreat because the challenges of digital literacy, monetization, sustainability, audience development, all those things have been overwhelming. And so I think with some notable exceptions, one of them being contemporary music, it's fair to say for the most part, digital culture in Australia has been evolving alongside most of our cultural work rather than actually within it. I think our sector has resisted change um, and it's been easy to do so because the dominant part of the sector hasn't really had to change. Arts organisations were still viable, even if they were only reaching a fraction of potential audiences. And even if those audiences all look the same, and even if those audiences were aging. But now traditional and creaking models of arts delivery and engagement have been sorely tested, especially those based on live attendance. And this pandemic has exposed numerous fault lines of deep inequity and starved the ecosystems of many industries, including ours. And social justice movements, global movements like Black Lives Matters have revealed in neon lights the systemic biases that pervade the cultural industries in Australia and the world over. And so this is where I think I'm aligned with you, Wesley, that despite the havoc the pandemic has wrought, I feel perversely optimistic because this is not a moment of restoration. And thank goodness for that. <laughs> I think reimagining is really swiftly becoming the next overused term of the moment. But this is undeniably a time where I think major social and cultural transformations seem not only possible, but inevitable. And the issues that are afflicting many of our arts organisations have become existential in a way. If they survive, what their survival takes, what form, how their art audiences and people adapt and shift, whether some of what has come before must be left behind. And that's, that's a difficult thing for many. Those are the questions that we're facing. And this year has pushed us so hard. So change that would have likely taken many years has been concertinaed into a matter of months. And it's been nothing short of breathtaking. But all of us, makers and audiences alike, are no longer digital arts dilettantes, but we're fast becoming super users, just like our kids, but I'll come back to that in a minute. And our audience research during COVID has clearly identified that the public appetite for ongoing digital engagement is enormous. Audiences see digital as an essential part of the offer going forward, not an adjunct. And as Wesley said, we've seen so many possibilities opening up around access, inclusion, uh, reaching broader and new audiences, artists and audiences with a disability or those living away from major cities or those who simply can't afford to take their family to a theatre event um, have reaped the opportunities of a wholly digital environment. And they are adamant that we cannot go back to exclusion and equality, inequality rather. So at Council, we have similarly supercharged our digital plans and we've developed a new digital culture strategy. Um, and we worked with key digital innovators, many of whom are not in the art sector to develop this, with the end game being to increase digital engagement with Australian arts and creativity. Why? Because it's essential for relevant, dynamic and resilient cultural industries, but also because of the knock-on effects it has for wellbeing and community and connection and generally for our society, our culture, our economy. Digital literacy in our sector is really low and we don't have the connections to the industries we need to. And while it's great that audiences are loving this new raft of digital offerings and there's enormous opportunities for broader and increased engagement, we're still going to have to crack those issues of monetization and remuneration for artists. And no one has really done that yet. And our strategy is also looking at some of the ethical considerations around privacy and access and the digital divide. Um, and we're looking at partnerships across film, TV, gaming, digital design, and the platforms and the business models and the structures we're going to need to meet this world head on. This is particularly important for young people. Four in five Australians aged 15 to 24 attend arts events. Two in three creatively participate, meaning they make or learn 
art and four in 10 give time or money to the arts. So in other words, young people are big participants in creative activity and big consumers of cultural work. They also have an extremely high appreciation of what art does, what it does for their health and well-being, their quality of life, as well as for our society more broadly. In fact, our research tells us that 91% of young Australians recognise the positive impacts of arts and creativity for their lives and communities. 91%, that's a big number. And I think what our research has also shown is that for everyone, um, of everyone, young people have the best understanding of the wider value of their engagement and they're valuing it and they're investing in it for their future. But in many ways, we've been neglecting the future of our young people. And if we're going to truly support these future citizens, citizens, we need to recognise that by, we need to begin with putting, recognising that digital culture is dominant in their lives. And we likely need to step aside and hand over authority to young people to imagine and create their own models for arts companies, community centres and spaces for sharing creative content. I wanted to quickly turn to First Nations, recognising the pandemic has also highlighted the urgent need for digital development in the world's oldest living culture. So we're also working on a First Nations digital strategy. As Wesley said, digital has tremendous potential to sustain and archive elder knowledges that are at risk of being lost forever. It's opening up new ways for community and intergenerational sharing of knowledge. It's providing extraordinary creative opportunities for empathy, connection and understanding. And I'm thinking of Lynette Walworth's VR work collisions as one such example of this. Uh, digital can enable our incredible First Nations cultures to reach so many more people in ethical and sustainable ways that don't pose health or other risks to some of our most vulnerable Australians. But with the opportunities come challenges and some of those challenges are really straightforward in terms of digital divides so access to technical infrastructure resources expertise all of this sees a critical and growing gap in digital literacy um, amongst first nations peoples many other issues are stemming from a lack of cultural competency in non-indigenous peoples so things like the framework for observing or experiencing or respecting and acknowledging indigenous protocols within the digital space is currently unclear and it's complex there's Indigenous cultural intellectual property protocols and copyright um, concerns that require further research and understanding. There's potential risk of reactive uploading of Indigenous knowledges without considering the rights to knowledge specific to age, kinship, women's or men's business and so on. And um, again, referencing Wesley, there's already a huge lack of understanding of the diversity across First Nations people and embedded, embedding this into a digital environment is also critical. So this is why we have a really urgent need right now to develop digital and entrepreneurial capacity building for First Nations artists and cultural practitioners. And just put really simply, we need to support the oldest living culture in the world to achieve digital sovereignty. So we need to build the programs to build the capacity for those sovereign digital, cultural and business frameworks. Um, and investing in First Nations digital is going to help enable greater community sustenance and all the good things that come with that. And frankly, if I was to back any Australian digital horse, I would be backing the First Nations one. Because in a content glut where we've got global competition for cultural con content now flooding our screens, this is Australian creativity that's truly unique and truly world leading, and it has great potential. I'll leave it there. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Wendy. Okay, we will move on to Astrid next. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so honoured to be part of this panel with these esteemed um, peers. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that I am coming to you from Brisbane, Mianjin um, country, and I would like to acknowledge the Yagara, uh, Yugambe and Mulanjali nations who have cared for this country for 60,000 years. And I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded over these lands. It's a real privilege to be speaking to you today. Um, I'm aware that um, both Wesley and Wendy have already talked about a couple of the things that I've been thinking about and so I, I'm going to come to you with really the only thing that I, I feel a, a true expert on which is my own experience <laughs> and so I'm hoping to bring to you just a, a story of optimism because I feel and as has been mentioned already that this time um, has presented us has forced us to consider new opportunities and while I mourn the loss of what has 
uh, gone from my old career, from the before times, I also can see that there is great opportunity for growth. And so I'd like to just quickly share, um, I am the founding director of Pub Choir, um, and it's become in the COVID times Couch Choir. Um, to give you some context, um, Pub Choir was, uh, it, it will again be, I hope, um, a, an internationally live touring act. Um, and it's a show that um, transforms audiences into choirs. They can be untrained people, they're strangers, it doesn't matter. The motto of the show is singing belongs to everybody. And throughout the course of one show, I teach the audience how to sing in harmony with one another. It's a really nice little utopia of humanity, really. Um, and I truly do believe that everybody can sing, not particularly well, for instance, but um, that's not just lip service. I think that everybody can be taught to work together in literal harmony. And I thought the quickest way to, to explain that to you was just to show you a very quick snippet of our Christmas show. So this is the last show that Pub Choir did in 2019 to set the scene, there were 3000 people in Brisbane who bought a ticket and they learned a Savage Garden song. So we'll just see a tiny little bit of it now. This is what it looks like. I could, I could listen to that all day. That's very self-serving though. Um, so you can see there that there are thousands of people of all different walks of life um, singing together in literal harmony. Um, and on top of that, um, on that evening, they raised over $130,000 for the women's legal service um, services in Queensland. So that became a real concern for me moving into the COVID times. How can we still transform the goodwill of a community event like that into tangible change for the community, which is something that we have been trying to do at pub choir shows. Fast forward to March, obviously we know the story, everything's canceled. Uh, pub choir was touring America. Um, in 2019, we did 72 shows to over a hundred thousand people. And obviously in 2020, we, we've done two shows. We had to hot foot it back to Australia to an empty calendar and that begged the question how do we make a living as artists when it turns out that choir uh, we thought we were lovable nerds but it's become this hotbed issue of just the most dangerous people um, and I have questions about that myself but here we are and so how do you transform this into a workable business model um, and of course desperation breeds innovation and so on that 40 hour long haul flight home I realized I had to adapt what we do instantly or we were going to fall behind the curve um, and so that's when couch choir was born so it's a similar idea I still believe everybody can sing and in fact everybody's singing voice is exactly the same as before. It's just that we can't do it in one another's company. Um, but the solution was to give people instructions to work through in their own time. So rather than working with a live audience, I record myself still teaching three different harmonies to a song, but I give those instructions out freely to the world. And I say, if you still want to be in my choir, listen to my video enough times that, so that you feel comfortable to join in with me. And when you're ready, video yourself and send it back. And then my team assembles these videos into a virtual choir. I'm sure you've seen clips of it. I might pop one in at the end if we've got time. Um, but there have been some takeaway lessons for me in doing this. So first of all, people are desperate to connect. We all kind of know that that to be true, but to see the actual numbers, um, the first couch choir event where I said, if anybody wants to, to join in, send in a video. And I thought maybe we'll have a hundred. There were 3000 people from multiple countries around the world that sent in a video desperate to connect and to still sing and to create art together. 
Um, fast forward now to our most recent Couch Choir, where we had over, again, 3,000 submissions from 48 countries around the world. So that really shows me that the demand is still, the appetite is huge to still consume and create and be a part of an artistic community. So that's good news. <laughs> um, the second thing that it's taught me is that accessibility was always possible but I didn't care enough to provide it. Um, Pub Choir was a in-person live show that we would travel around to major cities, mostly sometimes rural, but mostly capital cities around the world. And it made me realize that to take it online and to just put it out there, our diversity in our audience members and participants has, pardon me, exploded. <laughs> I mean, literally, we have more people from more countries um, included in our submissions. But more than that, there is a real cultural diversity and a, a much richer human experience involved in our choir. And you can hear the difference, actually. And it's it makes a better artistic product. Um, I will also say that our audience um, of people who follow pub choir and what we do has literally doubled since March. I know that sounds like just like a straight brag, um, but what it shows me is that diversity and making inclusions for accessibility for all people of walks of life around the world is always good business sense. Um, it, it wasn't right of us to only be focusing on those who could get a ticket and turn up uh, you know, on the night and stand up for the show. Um, so this experience has taught me that creating something that is freely accessible is always a good idea. The last thing that I will say about that is I've sort of broken my own cardinal rule about art and doing art for exposure. But what I have realized is that if I am the driver of my own free exposure, that transforms everything. We have to be given the autonomy to do what we want with our own art. And given that I am the one who is choosing to freely distribute these instructional videos to the world, then I have actually been approached by the corporate industry who want to use that in their own workplaces. So businesses from around the world have been asking, how can we give this experience to our employees who are now all working from home? So I guess, I hope it didn't sound too self-indulgent, but really what I've learned is to be very optimistic about the future. I think the future of arts lives in the digital sphere. And even when physical pub choir shows come back to venues around the world, I will still continue to do this virtual iteration because it has shown me that we are better together and to give more of your art is to receive, you know, so much more in return. I'll, I'll show you like 10 seconds. This is what Couch Choir looks like. If I can quickly share my screen. Oh God, talking about digital world. Here we go. Um, here it is. So this is... I feel like I didn't nail that share. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, you can find it online. It's all good. And um, I encourage everybody, um, your singing voice is still just as valuable today as it was in the before time. So thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, thank you, Astrid. Everybody is being so careful with the time that if you want to try it again, we, we have enough time to see it. Why don't you just uh, try once more to see if that'll come up? I'll give it a crack. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's have a look. Hopefully that was a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more successful. Great. Thank you so much, Astrid. Um, for those of you who haven't come across Pub Choir before, um, I'm not sure the audio does all that well when it's going through Astrid's computer and Zoom and out to all of us. So I urge you to um, look them up on, um, on YouTube because it's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that very optimistic piece. Um, and now we move to Indigo. 
Awesome. Hello. Can everyone see my slide okay? Wonderful. Hi, my name is Indigo Holton James and I'm a research fellow in the Technology Communications and Policy Lab in RMIT's Digital Ethnography Research Centre. I'm joining you all today from Nam, Melbourne, where I'm on Wurundjeri country. I want to acknowledge that sovereignty over these lands was never ceded and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm really grateful for the invitation to be part of today's conversation. Um, as researchers and practitioners who are actively engaged with Australia's cultural terrain, we tell stories. One of the key ways we do that is, of course, through digital platforms and technologies, as we're all joining together today. While these practices aren't new, COVID-19 has seen their rapid acceleration with the development, dissemination and consumption of cultural activity relegated to primarily online spaces. But to pick up on a few things that we've already discussed today, access to and use of these spaces remains profoundly uneven with digital inequity following social, economic and geographic contours. So if we're gonna talk about the intersections of technologies and creative futures, I think we also need to understand this unevenness and its influence, particularly around the ethical implications for not only who can consume this work, but also who can create and disseminate this digital cultural content. So we can define digital inclusion as an individual's ability to affordably access and use digital technologies in ways that allow for their effective participation in contemporary social, civic and cultural life. A digitally included person can access connectivity and devices and data. This access comes at an affordable price and they have the abilities or skills to use these devices and connections in ways that work for their life, in ways that they need to and they want to. But in 2020, around 2.5 million Australians or roughly 13% of the national population remains entirely offline. Even amongst those who are connected, there's huge diversity in terms of access to devices, data, connectivity, um, the cost of that access and the abilities needed to use that access. And as I've already mentioned, this unevenness falls along geographic, economic and social lines. So as the 2020 uh, Australian Digital Inclusion Index shows us, you are more likely to experience digital inequity if you're a member of a racial minority, are older, live in a rural location, or have a lower level of education or income. As this year has emphatically underscored again and again and again, digital inclusion is critical for participation in all contemporary life. And this, of course, extends into the cultural sector. When we think about digital inclusion in this context, we tend to think about the inclusion of audience members. We might refer to work um, by researchers such as Sabine Mihaud and colleagues in the United Kingdom who show us that although digitization is increasing and diversifying cultural content, all wonderful things, when we consider it in concert with digital inequity, it also is creating new opportunities for cultural distinction, segmentation and inequality. Well, I think it's really important that we talk about um, audiences in this context and the work that OSCO have been doing in this space is vital. Uh, we tend not to consider how digital inequity um, influences the creative and cultural institutions themselves. That is, we tend not to consider how digital inequity influences whether and how the sector is able to develop and disseminate this cultural content, let alone consume it as an endpoint. Research by myself and others shows that those three factors that determine individual digital inclusion, that access, affordability and abilities piece, are all influential at the institutional level, but it plays out slightly differently. Um, developing and sharing digital cultural content requires not only infrastructural access, but it requires access to devices that are able to capture, create and upload high quality content. It requires that staff are equipped with the abilities to do all of this work and that the value of digital practices and content is understood and supported throughout the institution. Crucially, this all needs to be affordable. 
the institution needs to be able to hire, resource and fund digital work. And it is expensive. Digital inequity, much like digital inequity elsewhere in the cultural sector, is informed by both the organisation type and location. State and national institutions and those based in capital cities tend to be more digitally active, experience fewer barriers and have better access to skills than the arts and creative sector as a whole. As a regional New South Wales gallery worker succinctly described in a recent interview I did, they simply did not have the staffing capacity, the digital knowledge, the digital equipment or the digital budget to adapt that in the wake of COVID-19 that other organisations did. What I take from this is that digital inequity is creating enormous unevenness in terms of who is able to do this work. Um, and it, it extends to who is able to do this work within the institutions. So in my previous work, I've worked with remote Indigenous art centres and a lot of the things that Wesley was raising really rang true. Uh, and what I can say is that although the buildings in which uh, remote Indigenous art centres are situated in tend to be digitally connected, this doesn't always extend to the artists themselves with digital participation remaining the preserve of non-Indigenous art centre managers. And while regional community museums are increasingly using online cataloging platforms to preserve and make their cultural content accessible, the lack of digital skills held, held by their predominantly elderly volunteers profoundly influences their capacity to accurately and effectively catalog these items, thereby impeding their accessibility. They might be online, but they're really hard to find. So the accelerated digital transformations we've seen this year, I think highlight that the digital inequities confronting the sector are creating divides that are much wider than we previously thought. As Harry Vivian of Europeana notes, these divides run between institutions. It runs within the institutions and they're about our processes as much as systems and about people as much as hardware. I think we're at a point in the sector where you know, COVID has highlighted that these issues are massive and that we can make really profound shifts and steps towards resolving it. As part of this, I welcome the current parliamentary inquiry's focus on the potential that the digital environment provides the sector. But I think that the uneven distribution of these opportunities requires further thought. If we don't address digital inequity, we run the risk of cultivating creative futures that neglect diverse perspectives and practices and further disadvantage underfunded and under-resourced institutions. But it's not all doom and gloom. I think we have several spaces in which we can make real change around this. One possibility for resolving these concerns, I think could be through the Commonwealth Government's digital transformation strategy. Uh, we already have a roadmap for upskilling uh, Australian institutions, if we incorporate the cultural sector in that roadmap, we can position building digital capacity within the sector as part of that strategy so that over the next decade, we have a clear plan to significantly increase the digital resources available to small and otherwise disadvantaged institutions. I'll leave it there, but I look forward to further unpacking how we might consider digital spaces themselves uh, as stumbling blocks blocks to generating technology driven creative futures and I welcome anyone interested in continuing these conversations to get in touch. Thanks. Thanks so much Indigo. Um, it's quite interesting how these papers um, intersect so, so neatly. Um, there's two issues that I'd like to follow up on uh, before we open it up to, um, to the broad audience. Um, one is economics and the other is community. Um, and I might go with economics first. Um, and I'm going to bring in a comment that the Honorable Paul Fletcher, who's Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and Arts noted in his opening remarks to this symposium. He said, there's no shortage of money going into the arts sector. Now I'm curious about where you would like that money to go if there is no shortage of money and you can um, quibble with that if you like. I, that's, I'm just noting what he said. But I'm also interested, uh, Wesley talked about uh, economic imperatives reducing innovation and that money is all, almost worthless. And I'd love to hear more about uh, what you mean by that. 
um, and I could include snippets from each of you, but um, I'm also really interested, Indigo, in your comments that um, the digital transformation strategy really needs to incorporate the cultural sector, and maybe that's one way that that money that the minister was talking about could get redistributed. So, um, Wesley, I've referred to you specifically, so why don't you begin? Well, my provocation was that, in fact, in, in this day and age, where billions of dollars are floating around, it's almost like uh, we've, we've turned everything on its head, that where money is worthless, unless it's there to support uh, the, the sense of community and the idea of our, our health as a community going forward. So, so, I mean, I'm being very provocative. Of course, money is, has meaning. But this notion too that there's lots of money going around is interesting because there's been structural changes, especially in the arts around the, the casualization of the workforce and the, the different things. So in fact, many artists rely on very little money and that this idea of, if I had my way, where the money would go is looking at how a, a living wage for artists can mean that we can participate in our community more rather than the idea that we go with our hand out all the time asking for support. And that often, when I, when I was provoking us around the idea of the economic imperative being suspended at the moment, is that we are, we are using a lot of um, socialism to keep, to prop capitalism up at the moment. And so the idea that the digital technologies, as I think almost every speaker has said, is very much a kind of, how do we monetize it? How do we actually provide a living for artists? How do we kind of keep pushing forward? And if, if we actually believed in, well, you know, the, the universal basic income is a wonderful idea in my head because artists can then participate in society as artists rather than as economic units. And I'm thinking we're seeing a glimpse of how that's possible at the moment through JobKeeper and JobSeeker and how artists are kind of making work. There's one company in Adelaide, I'll just use a quick anecdote, uh, called Gravity and the Other Myths. They normally have four companies touring the world. They've all been grounded during COVID and they've used JobKeeper to create a 38 person acrobatic show that we'll do as part of um, Sydney Festival. And that we go, okay, they just didn't sit around and take the money. They made what is I think an extraordinary piece of art that will then be played to multiple audiences over time. And so there's a sense of saying artists keep participating even if they don't have a, a, you know, a, a steady income. But when you give them a steady income, they make works of scale and of true interest. Thank you. Um, Indigo, do you want to pick up on anything? Yeah, I think in terms of the digital transformation strategy, I think what is really needed, and Wendy might also want to jump in around the work that OSCO is doing in this space, uh, but I think it needs to be around developing the skills and capacity building in the sector. Um, I was having a conversation with Seb Chan at ACME recently, and we were talking about the notion of digital fluency as a way of shaping digital skills, not just as a sort of rubric that you can tick off, but as a way of operating within digital platforms uh, and that that learning is ongoing, but that also the institutions themselves need to become digitally fluent. It's not that the role sits within one person or one department is the digital thing. We need to take digital seriously and institutions need to be entirely digital and non-digital in order to continue. So I guess it comes back to what you were saying too, about um, so many institutions don't have a digital budget and you're suggesting that that will just have to be part of the norm going into the future? I think so. I think the research that I've been doing during lockdowns uh, around this digital shift and how digital inclusion has affected the sector. So many people talked about digital projects and skills being contracted in or used with grant funding to fund projects and practices. The grant funding or the project finishes and those skills leave. I think those skills needed to be embedded. And I think that digital needs to be understood as an operational cost. It needs to be funded as a permanent fixed uh, investment across the sector. 
Yeah, well, Wendy, this connects to what you were saying too. Do you wanna pick up on this as well? Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with Indigo. I think it's one of those things, instead of thinking of digital as something that you do in addition to, or um, once you've made your live experience and you think about how you translate that into a digital thing, it needs to be happening in, as, as part of the, the very offer. And audiences have said that's what they want as well. And I think there's a lot of, you know, through the, the pandemic, you've seen a lot of um, commentary around uh, people mourning the loss of the live experience and, and that kind of um, concern or fear that that digital is somehow taking away something beautiful that we'll never have again. And I remember hearing about this when, you know, audio books were coming in or, you know, people are like, well, this is the death of the book. It's not the death of the book. People are still going to want it. But everyone is going to want to have that curtain up moment, that sitting in a theatre with other people, that deep sense of connection. The pandemic has really shown us and the audience research that we've been doing with Wolf Brown and also Pattern Makers here, which has been really, really insightful, is that people are loving themselves in this new digital environment. They are loving the fact that they can watch theatre from their lounge room if that's what they want to do. But that doesn't mean they're not going to go back to the theatre. And in fact, the research shows us that as people get exposed to more Australian content through digital, they are more likely to want to continue to go back to a theatre. So it's an amplification and an addition of experience rather than a cannibalization. But what it does mean is that you, you can't look at it as bluntly as, you know, we now need to fund every organization to become digital. We need to, and the capacity building thing that, that Indigo discussed, this is when we've seen, and it's not always about money because when we've seen like in Canada, when they had a significant injection into their arts budget, when Trudeau came to power and the Canada council's budget was doubled, they started in putting out all these digital funds, but the sector couldn't, do it. They were, they were coming to them with proposals of how do we build a website because of the low levels of digital literacy. So that was one example of where money just wasn't the solution. It needs to be much more than that. And in England, the Arts Council England have been thinking a lot about this, and they've got a whole team of digital upskillers who are based within the Arts Council who work with arts organisations to build their capacity. So that's another way of dealing with it. And thirdly, and I think this actually addresses one of the questions in the chat, but it's about thinking who you need to have as part of your team. And there's new and different roles in your team that people haven't in, in traditional arts organization models they haven't thought about so one of the most successful um, engaged digital institutions that was formerly an analog institution if i can put it like that was the chicago field museum and you're thinking why is this museum so so successful it's because they hired a youtuber to do their engagement with young people and then now they've got this incredible offer i love the channel i go there all the time i've got my kids on and all the rest of it but then they've been constantly thinking about how they operate in those multiple layers of environments and that is the thing where we need to start shifting I mean, if you want to operate in a solely live environment, that, that certainly is your call as an arts organisation, but you just need to accept that when a pandemic hits, you're going to be stuffed. So it's, it's, it's just... Can, can I add to this, Joanne? Yes. At the Sydney, Sydney Festival, we were talking about this and saying digital this and online that, and the younger generation of our workers said, we don't call it that, you know, and <laughs> we just don't call it digital. It's just our life. And so we were then saying it's actually about your experience. And so there's a in theatre work and there's the at home work mm -hmm. and it just is accessed in different ways. And we need to change our mindsets around that as well. Yeah. My, my well, children laughed at me when I said I was doing digital transformation strategy. They said, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> really important. Um, Astrid, can I come to you on this? Because you're uh, a perfect ex example of someone who has had to make that switch practically overnight. Can you identify one or two really um, difficult things that you had and managed to surmount in um, turning from pub choir to couch choir, technologically in the digital context? Yeah, Whether absolutely. Not, we'll call it that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, the online sphere. Um, I think <laughs> The, uh, to be very blunt, we didn't even have enough technology to cope with the demand of um, what we were receiving in submissions for people who wanted to be part of it. And so um, I was just thinking of, of popping in with this anyway into the discussion that I think part of the future strategy of keeping this a financially viable way of delivering arts to the world and to our communities is that we have to integrate more with corporate sectors or the private sector. Um, I think if COVID has shown us anything, there was a lot of money being wasted in things like events budgets and pamphlets when, it, you know, we were wasting time traveling to and from work. I mean, all of this waste has been stripped away and that there are budgets that remain that could be used to help 
things like the arts industry. And that's how we solved our technical problems. I literally got on LinkedIn <laughs> and I sent someone a message and I said, can I have some computers? <laughs> and I showed them our project and I said, you're not using your event budgets anymore. And we can make a real difference in the community and we can make people feel together again if you help us with this. And they said yes, because there is this um, strange place at the moment where companies have a whole year of budgeting and they're looking for ways to use it. And I, th I would really encourage other artists to be, you know, almost aggressive, not angry, but aggressive out there and looking for these ways to connect with other facets of, of our community because um, I think it's it's sometimes a fallback option to be a um, bit cool and go on the road alone. But if, you know, this this digital transformation has taught us anything, we are better if we are more connected. And so we we just needed more power to, to um, like, like Indigo was talking about, you know, if you don't have good enough technology, you can't be part of the digital world. And so I had to go out and find it. And I'm obviously in a privileged place to find that, but um, I think that's the solution is to, is to connect more with a few other spheres of life outside of the arts industry. Thank you, that's really helpful. And that actually leads into the, the second question that I wanna raise, which is um, about community. And I was, I, I guess I'm thinking, uh, we have to set aside the professional arts worker from this question or from what I'd like to discuss, but all four of you have talked in different ways about a broadened community and a broadened community of makers. And I guess we could say of consumers as well. And I think we should um, tease this out a little bit. Um, and Astrid, we'll start with you. Um, you talked about how um, when you moved to, to Couch Choir, it expanded or automatically you had 3,000 people coming from 48 different countries. But one of the things that I was fascinated with um, in watching the Couch Choir videos is how young the demographic was. I mean, you had, you had people who were well into their 80s and 90s, but you had lots of children that you would never have been able to incorporate into pub choir for obvious reasons. So could you just talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the, um, the broadening of community and why that's going to be so important in the future? Yes, I mean, I think I might not even be speaking just for pub choir, but I know we were probably stuck in a little bit of a rut with our audience demographic. I'm not bemoaning having this audience, but I noticed that it had strongly skewed um, to, to white women um, between 45 to 60. Actually, that's what our, our social media demographics tells us. I think it was over 60% of our followers were of this demographic in the before times. I don't have the, the statistics on hand, but you are absolutely correct in saying that it's not just a visual thing for Couch Quiet. The audience has, has transformed. It's totally different. It's more culturally diverse. Um, it's much skewed uh, in, in a much younger way now because of this digital world. <laughs> um, I, I think this is something to be embraced. And, and so, like I said before, I think um, even when the physical shows come back, it is so important to us to keep the digital side of things of Couch Choir going because that is how we connect with more than one generation and more than one demographic. And diversity, I think, um, adds so much, of course it adds richness to art and to life and to humanity. And our show is run by two diverse women and yet our audience wasn't reflecting that. And now in the digital space, it is. And that is such a relief. <laughs> I'm very grateful for that. And I, yeah, we will continue to, to connect with that audience online. Great. Okay. Um, would anyone else like to take this up? Wesley, you're oh, unmuted. <laughs> I know I keep my, my, my computer's doing weird and wonderful things. Um, just to say that I've been fascinated also what Astrid talked about with this idea of uh, almost collective ownership as well. That, you know, you said before, Joanne, let's put the professional arts worker to one side. But in fact, let's look at the professional arts worker in this kind of more participatory model. And how do we, if not monetize it, how do we reward it financially from a community perspective as well? This, this idea of collective ownership of output is fascinating. And Astrid, I think, you know, pub choir is one of those fantastic ideas where you go, how do you, how do you put collective, collectivism in the center rather than individual ownership? And, and collective ownership is very, it's a very First Nations perspective. 
and the idea that the artist is connected to community rather than an expert uh, elite position only. And I'm, I'm in, enjoying this idea that the digital technologies during this pandemic have broken down a little bit more that distinction of where the expert lies, where the elite lies and where participation lies. And in the end, what the only problem we have is how do we keep uh, an elite uh, expert artist alive uh, when, uh, you know, through some kind of monetary reward and whether that's a public dollar conversation or as Astrid was saying, also the participation of more corporate dollars and corporate uh, support along the way. Good, great. Okay, um, Wendy or Indigo, anything else to add? It's fine if you I don't. Think I might jump in actually. Uh, and to, to take seriously the professional arts worker again, um, just quickly, I think so many participants in my recent study have been saying that, you know, COVID has massively distributed the digital skills amongst the team. You know, you have a curatorial team who used to hand over all the content to the media and comms person. Now they're engaged and they're doing this work as well. So I think there is a distribution of makers and creators of digital content going on in these, in these contexts. But I think, again, I'm harping on about this, but it goes back to digital literacies and skills in these spaces. Um, so many people talked about fear around creating things that didn't work or that weren't high enough quality or that didn't uh, represent the institution effectively or to the best of its ability. And I think that's a really interesting part of this as well, those fear questions and around what that looks like and how we can overcome that as well. Great. Wendy? I would just add, I, and it, it kind of expands on a couple of the points, but, you know, our research tells us that the two biggest barriers to arts attendance are cost and time. Um, and what digital does is overwhelm both of those and take those out of the picture in a really important way. And, you know, listening to Astrid, I remember when I was the director of Sydney Writers Festival, my demographic was also that, that was my demographic. And, um, and it didn't matter what I programmed, it would still be that demographic because this was a space which uh, that particular demographic felt that they owned and were very comfortable in it. And then thinking about how that has just exploded in the digital space, this is wonderful. And that idea of participatory leadership that Wesley touched on, that's something which was already starting to come to the fore before all of this and now I think it's the opportunity for that to really take over is is so exciting because it means we, we're moving into very different models um, and that and and great ones that that bode very well for community cohesion and engagement great well we have a number of questions that have been um, uh, raised by our audience and many of them touch on the things that we've been talking about um, I'll just uh, pick up a couple of them. First of all, um, how does an arts agenda for digital literacy connect to the national agenda for digital literacy, which is run out of prime minister and cabinet, or actually at the heart of the government? Um, Indigo, maybe you should start on this because you're talking about the importance of, um, of this new strategy. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. I think, so I think a lot of the work that we have in Australia around digital inclusion at an individual level uh, is based at a particular skill set of what it means to participate as an individual in Australia, in the digital space, uh, and what we need to do to learn those skills and implement those skills. I think digital skills for the cultural sector and as cultural practitioners are an advanced skill set that actually uh, require quite a lot more work and a lot more engagement. So I think that while we can embed with and build on existing work in digital inclusion, I think we do need to talk about a slightly different framework of looking at this. And I think that notion of digital fluency offers a really strong starting point. Um, but again, I think you know, the more people that we can get engaged and working in these spaces, the better. And there is a follow-on question that's, uh, that asks, how are older people being educated in digital literacy? Yeah, absolutely. There are like quite a lot of work going on around this sort of stuff. Uh, Telstra, their big, uh, they do an enormous 
amount of work with the Tech Savvy Seniors Program. Um, there's the Be Connected project that comes out of the UK and has all sorts of engagements in community organisations in the cultural sector. Uh, and another question in the chat sort of touches on this around the role of peak bodies and digital engagement. Um, in Victoria, we've got uh, Australian Museums and Galleries Australia Victoria. They have a project called Victorian Collections, which goes out to community uh, museums to help them digitize their collections. And as part of that, they do go and provide digital inclusion interventions. Participants are provided extensive training in how to use digital cataloging systems. Uh, they learn all of these things. They're supported to develop uh, an internet connection in their collections house. Uh, and I've worked with them previously and I think there are such great digital inclusion outcomes that come out of this. I'll just mention one and it's my favorite, John, a participant uh, who was in his late seventies who did this six week uh, cataloging program. And by the end of it, he'd never had internet before, but by the end of it, he was online shopping and he bought uh, two new hats. He had his Stetson hat for just being at home. And then he had his Stetson going out hat. Uh, so, you know, there's heaps of work going on in this space that I think we can build up. That's great. Wendy, do you want to come in on any of that? No, no obligation. We've got lots more questions. Sorry, I've got a sticky mute button. Um, yeah, I think one of the things we need to do as well in the cultural sector is explode our ideas about what art is. I think we've been wedded to very um, and this is where, I, you know, First Nations is the exception because it's not wedded to particular forms. But, you know, even at the Australia Council, you know, focused on things like there is dance, there is theatre, there is literature, there is music and there is so on, um, without actually recognising that those uh, categorisations are becoming increasingly meaningless. Um, and thinking about what it means, and, and there's a kind of snobbery as well. Like I've been spending a lot of time talking to gamers and the gamers are like, you people in the arts don't recognise what we do as art and it is art and I'm thinking not only is it art but it also employs writers it has strong narrative it employs musicians it employs actors and it's it's and it was one of those things that went kaboom during COVID you know the World Health Organization was telling everyone to do more gaming because it was so so great for their mental health and so on so this was something which actually you know enjoyed an explosion during a time of a pandemic but thinking about how we've created these um, artificial divides between the allied and related areas of our industries that we really need Need to to start becoming permeable and fluid across those kinds of things and thinking about how we work collaboratively and not within our own silos anymore and realizing that the art that is being created for the next generation for young people as well it, it's going to be different to what you know Wesley grew up with what I grew up with um, you know speaking it, so I think we just need to to realize that some of those it's about what we need to leave behind to to meet the future and arts organizations as well need to shift thinking about that too, which is challenging when you've had a business model that was serviceable in the past. I, I, oh, sorry, Wesley, go ahead. Oh, I just want to add to this, this notion too, that I think many arts organisations see digital platforms as just a delivery platform instead of actually a cultural space. And that the, we often get the sense of saying, well, we just moved, it's just another form of email. You know, there's, there's that kind of very unsophisticated view of what the digital spaces are, are capable of. And that we, I think as, as the, the, the artists, if you like to take on that mantle, that we don't actually have the confidence in our society enough to take on other kind of art forms and be as generous. And that there is a kind of lack of confidence that wants to shut things out rather than kind of embrace. And that we only think of the um, broad generalization, but we only think of what can the digital do for me rather than how do I shift and change my perspective? Yeah, that's a really good point. And it does tie into the um, feeling in a number of the questions we've got. Um, and I, in asking this next question, I want to go back to a point you made, Wendy, where you talked about 19th century art forms 20th century business models and 21st century people, which is a fantastic encapsulation. We've kind of talked about 21st century people already, but there are a lot of questions there about how we transform from the 20th century business model to a, a, a more up-to-date business model. Do you want to say anything about that? 
I think what was really interesting was even pre-COVID, this conversation was very, very live. And I remember talking to uh, people who make, you know, symphony orchestras or all the rest of it and going, the kids aren't coming. You know, we're not getting younger people. Our audience is, is, is... And then you think about, but where... And there's been so much research done on this and some really good research, which is where do younger audiences want to be? And it's not necessarily in a theatre or a hall where they can't talk to their friends or they can't have a drink or they can't have a conversation or doing those kinds of things. And then I was talking to this person who was running a symphony orchestra and said, but when you do symphony in the park, what happens then? And they're like, oh, it's gangbusters. And I was like, yeah, and what's the diversity of the audience and who are the young people and all the rest of it? So it's about thinking you need to, instead of making something and then hoping that people will come, you need to think about how you can take your work to the people and and meet them there because otherwise you will dwindle in relevancy so I think what digital you know this this kind of moment has, has taken that and you know put that on steroids as well I was talking to some Singaporean colleagues who have coined as, as Singapore does digital which is the idea of this hybrid model of physical and digital and thinking how can you if you have a take for example a theater performance which traditionally would have been a live performance how do you augment and make that amazing in a digital way as well so it's not a recording of what happened live it is this augmented opportunity for engagement in a digital space which is really really exciting so thinking about those kinds of propositions which goes very much what Wesley was saying before is you're not you're not just copying it and then putting it online it is an entirely different way of thinking about how do I make work for this space that is a different space where people already are they're already there so um, and the thing with digital is that you can go so wide um, often you think of a live performance as a, a sort of deep immersion but with digital you can have wide you can have wide and many and I was thinking during COVID one of the first plays I saw was this tiny little theatre company in Woolloomooloo who you know they're, they're house is 60 um, and they put on a reading of Lyle Kessler's Orphans um, and they managed somehow to wingle wangle Alec Baldwin to do one of the readings and thousands of people were watching that live as opposed to the 60 people who might have come if they'd had a full house you know for one of their nights so thinking about that is the first part of thinking about when you've got the many at a at a lower price point how do we work out the monetization piece and that's that's as I said no one's cracked it yet globally but it's something which has to be done and thinking about because gamers have cracked it other people have cracked it it's just our sector necessarily hasn't landed on the right business models that are going to see us through to that point yet. Well, I'm interested in hearing from both Astrid and Wesley about this. Um, first of all, you, Astrid. So let's fast forward to the end of, well, the beginning of 2022. Where do you imagine pub choir slash couch choir will be? Oh, boy. Like, I'm struggling at the moment to imagine what it'll be next week. <laughs> but, you know, I wish that we had this conversation in two weeks' time because... Um, currently right now we're running a slightly different version of Couch Choir um, and I didn't quite get time to talk about this in my in my spiel um, but at previously Pub Choir was also a vehicle for social change because we were raising money for very localized charity groups and of course in the digital sphere um, I haven't felt able to to do that but we've just launched our first couch choir for a cause we've partnered with the charity this time and and I wish that I could tell you the results of that because um, previously people gathering together to make communal art so we're talking about community music making not not the professional level that left people with such an overwhelming sense of community goodwill that they would empty their pockets and swipe their cards on the way out. And we would raise just really insane amounts of money in one show. And now I'm wondering um, how we will go if we have met people where they are. So I'm hoping what Wendy was just talking about where you have to find meet meet people where their need is they are online at the moment and they want to connect but they it's illegal to <laughs> so we're we've hoping and I, and I, I yeah I feel sad that this is just two weeks now but um I'm hoping that meeting people where they are online and giving them the freedom so not just logging in for a specific amount of time but saying here's 12 days and we want you to create at any time that is suitable to you. And you are welcome at any time in those 12 days. And at the end of that, if it's given you a sense of goodwill, then we ask you to make a donation as well. And we're hoping to raise $50,000. And, and I'm hoping that that will be the future moving on 
we have met people first and tried to fill a need that they have now in the digital sphere. And then I hope that that will create a sense of wanting to be part of something tangibly with, with money, <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm being honest. Um, but I, I'm hoping to have both the, the pub choir and couch choir shows together into the future. I hope that both of those things can now coexist. Great. Okay. Well, Wesley, um, Wendy's mentioned that nobody's cracked the, um, mm. the new business model yet. We know that. But I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about um, how you're framing a Sydney festival for uh, 2021. Um, obviously, we don't need details of what's in and what's not. But, um, you know, what kinds of shows are they all local? Um, by that, I mean Australian. And then how do you imagine that will um, continue to affect festivals in particular in the future? Well, uh, two things. We went all Australian made back in March mm -hmm. and we're investing over $6 million into artists and organisations and, and venues uh, during, during January in 2021 in Sydney. And we're saying, thinking that there's actually a... Uh, an interesting kind of dilemma because I think the, the the human nature is that we crave company, we crave community, we crave connection with others, uh, and I think a physical way as well as digital. And that we, though, in this next iteration of how society works, we are becoming more fluid about how that engagement is is occurring. So Sydney Festival is doing, as I said, an online program, uh, sorry, a, an at-home program, which is our digital broadcast, our live streaming, our talks. But also we're saying, actually, some things are not about the visual. Some things are audio, you know, let's not get caught up just because we can video conference that we have to. Some things which are just about ideas, the, the growth of podcasts as a, as a kind of audio experience is also part of it. And that we kind of need to break down what are the, the, the sensory natures of being human and how do we break that down so that we can look at, yes, we have the haptic, yes, we have the sense of physical connection. So a lot of outdoor shows, lots and lots of outdoor shows. And in fact, we, we, we're launching a big outdoor performance space um, called The Headland. And at, all, at, at this point in time, we're already, that's the highest selling shows. Why? Because I think people feel safer outdoors. But number two, there's a sense of, that's where large gatherings can actually occur. We can get 1500 people COVID safe into that, into, whereas when you can only get into, let's say an 800 seat theater, we can only get 400 people at the moment. And distance, you don't get the same kind of sense of people gathering. So I think that we, well, that we, will, we will continue to work on what is the right way of connecting the right audience with the right experience? And so what is something that works best in the physical realm? And how do we then lower the, the threshold of engagement in terms of if you are risk averse of spending the money or the time or the energy, how can you engage and say, actually, I mean, the, the Metropolitan Opera in New York is a very good example of this, that they argue that their their sales for their actual attending opera jumped by, I think it was over 20 something percent because people could have watched them online or in their um, in the cinemas and they watch it and go, oh yeah, I think I do like that. Or, you know, so you lower the threshold for experiences and people go, okay, now I'm prepared to take a bit of a risk. Or it builds a sense of celebrity as well around the event the live experience, like I think many bands experience this. Yes, you can sell CDs and sell CDs, but it's actually the live gig is where you make more money and people find the celebrity of the live gig, this sense of like-minded people coming together. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that it won't be uh, digital at home on your screen is never going to fully replace the human emotion of connection and, and the need to connect but it will augment it so it'll always be hand in glove and that audiences will choose what's the right experience for them when, and we have to provide the options. Great. Well, um, I, your example of the Metropolitan Opera is very interesting. Um, Indigo's mentioned Sebastian Chan, who works in museums. He said at a conference I, um, uh, where I heard him speak a few years ago that where, what, wherever a museum gets involved in a digital platform, 
the visits to the museum go up. So people engage very heavily with the digital and then they want to come in. So it is very much, as you say, hand in glove. Um, but also, um, Wesley, I'm fascinated by the um, uh, potential um, additional benefit of that investment in the local, in the building of the arts community at the local scale, which is obviously something good for everybody too. And can I just take this point too, to, to talk about ideas of quality there's a kind of paralysis of integrity around digital to go, oh, if I can't do it perfectly, I shouldn't do it at all. When in fact, I think people are used to um, looking at content differently now. You know, you know, we've all got very different lighting states. We've all got different kind of <laughs> engagements. This camera on my iPad is shocking. But, but so we're engaging in different ways. And what we believe is high quality is not always the thing that the audience are valuing. They're valuing the access more than anything else. They're used to watching things on small screens, large screens, high definition, low definition, with sound quality up and down, but they're engaging in the content more. And I think that's something we should do too. Like some of our, um, at the Sydney Festival, yes, we're gonna look at some very high end kind of uh, um, live streaming broadcasting, but also there's some things that we're just gonna shoot on an iPhone and just to kind of give people access that not everything has to be broadcast quality like it was you know, built for Netflix. Some things are allowed to be rough. And that in, in some ways in that roughness, people can see themselves that they have the means of production as well, that they can make content for you because they're, you're more and more accessible. The more polished you get, sometimes we can distance the participatory, uh, those who wish to participate, we can, we can take those people who are motivated by participation, push them aside and say, you will never be like this. And I think that the arts have, we have an addiction to being elite, which we have to kind of question. Right. And does anybody else want to come in? I was just, I was like, how hard do I nod so that Wesley knows that <laughs> I agree? I, um, I was head banging because I think my entire business model is based on this idea of average being okay and allowing people to embrace that and I think the creative industry for the most part is absolutely throttled by the pursuit of per perfection there is obviously a place for aiming to be the top of the tree you know the best um, but on the large part exactly what Wesley said people want to see themselves reflected in art and if you make it so inaccessible that they don't see themselves they don't want to watch the art and so doing pub choir around this idea of you are good enough as you are and we will make you part of the whole is is it has run my entire life and I just couldn't agree more with what Wesley said. Well, and what I was suggesting is that this is a very First Nations perspective, that participation, the idea of process, the idea of practice is actually more important than the outcome in itself because the outcome will shift and change and fashion will tell you what's good and what's not good. But the idea that culture is something that you practice rather than observe is the biggest thing that I think the arts needs to learn. And in fact, yes, headbutting, headbutting. <laughs> but this idea of how do we as artists say, actually, you can be excellent at practice, act excellent at this idea of participation. And then we can also, like we do as sports people, I can appreciate, you know, an elite sports person, even though I can't run as fast as them. But I know how it works and how do I kind of, uh, encourage artists to do that same thing. Yes, I can play a mean oboe, but listen to this amazing school band play and get excited that we are connected rather than in fact, there's a schism between this, this weird excellence thing and community. It's weird, it's a weird disconnect. Can I just add to that? Because I think um, it also highlights, fest we love festivals in Australia. And one of the reasons why Australians love festivals is because they are fairly democratic um, and people feel that they can go and they explore and they can test and they can try without the kind of pressure or the or the fear, the genuine fear of walking into the hallowed halls of a, a venue, which in which isn't, which isn't a place where they feel either invited or welcome or comfortable, but festivals are safe um, because it's, it is about community participation and you feel like you can try take riskier choices than you might do otherwise. And I think that digital uh, space 
amplify it because you can dip in, test, check, think, oh, I do like opera. I, I always thought I hated it, but I actually like it. That's not me. But um, there's a whole way, there's ways where you can read that. But I think you get your exposure to stuff that you would have thought was not for me. And that goes to that feeding that narrative of the arts being an elitist thing rather than actually the substance of our daily lives. Great. Okay, another question from the list. Um, what are the panel's thoughts about the arts cooperating more with other sectors? We talked about business models, but what about arts collaborating with business, with academia, um, for instance, a triple helix approach to find more innovative and creative solutions to social, cultural, digital challenges? Now, Astrid, you mentioned this a little bit when you approached a business and um, asked for their events budget and their computers, which is great. Anybody else want to take up some options or um, some thoughts about this? I'm happy to jump in and say that we're terrible at it. But <laughs> we need to you mean in Australia generally? The arts generally, globally. Arts generally. We, we don't automatically think about who we need to engage with and, and why we should. Um, and thinking, you know, even the art screen divide is something which baffles me. These are very much allied industries, but you've got your cultural producers who make arts or cultural content, and then you have your screen producers who make screen content. And it's the same thing, just like, it's how do you how do you make sure that you don't have that, that kind of divide? So I think part of it is recognising the opportunities for collaboration and, and what might come up out of that. It's, it's really exciting. In terms of the academy, there's so many opportunities for collaboration. And, and you do see some really great things coming through a lot of um, the academic institutions as well but there is definitely and, and to be honest I think the future is collaboration I don't think anyone can do these things on their own that partnership is critical and you need to go into partnership with that open mind to realize that your partner may not think the same as you and that's okay they might have a different idea to you which really challenges you and that's okay too um, but the importance is to go in there and go what can I learn from this partner and and then they may well learn from you too, but it is about that open entry into it without thinking, I'm joining up with this person to get something out of them. I add to that, Wendy, this idea that we ask our audiences to be curious. We ask our audiences to experience things that are different. And so the arts then saying, oh no, we won't do that is kind of, you know, it, it, well, you're cutting yourself off from your community and from a sense of um, where the world's going. And, and this idea of curiosity which is embedded, let's say, in gaming, you know, where you trial and error and you are curious about the next step. And that whole culture about curiosity is embedded, I think, in, in many young people. And that if you come up against then the monolith that, and not all arts is like this, but the monolith of arts and the kind of that, that baggage. Um, and we are not then as curious as, as, say, they are of course, we're going to look old fashioned. And so what we need to do is, I think, embed in every work that we're doing a sense of kind of curiosity about the human state, about how we engage, and that it, that if we are cutting things off because we are fearful, then, well, that's not how you build a community. That's not how you build a future, by being scared of it. And I think that we need to, to do more of that. And that idea of the triple helix is absolutely fine. And in more than anything else, it's not just about, let's say, technology in the arts, but also sustainability, the environment, that we are not hermetically sealed from the most important issues in the, in the world. And yet sometimes I think our art forms are invested in not engaging enough. I think just to jump in from the academic side of things, uh, please. We would love to collaborate more. We love this stuff. You guys do so much interesting innovation at all times and you're leaking like new ways of modeling and thinking and doing things. I think it is crazy that we're not documenting and learning from all of this stuff all the time. Um, yeah, please get in touch. <laughs> Well, we are fast approaching, for, uh, well, it's 4.30 my time, 5.30 for some of you, and sorry, I can't do the translations to the other states right now. Um, but that's a provocation, I think, for our audience and for the Academy, that kind of um, uh, collaboration. But um, just a couple of um, words that uh, Wesley's thrown out at the end, collaboration, curiosity in the human state, sustainability, the environment, all of those things so, so important. And um, 
Um, yeah, thank you, panelists. I think it's been a terrific discussion, raising an awful lot of um, ideas that have come together and intersected so well. So thank you, Wesley Enoch, Wendy Ware, Astrid Jorgensen, and Indigo Holcomb James. And thank you to the audience too, who uh, you've come up with some terrific questions. Um, I will just alert you before we finish to the next events in the symposium. So tomorrow at four o'clock for um, Canberra, Sydney and Melbourne, at, uh, yeah, four o'clock for those ones, um, session two, continuous and diverse, a long history of many cultures. And that will be another session just like this at, uh, for an hour and a half. There's also a satellite event tomorrow morning, 10.30, again, for those uh, Eastern um, capital cities, 10.30 to 12. This is satellite event two called Inquiring Minds, what artists can bring to government and industry research by the Australia Council for the Arts. So there's an opportunity to think about some of that collaboration. And also I alert you to uh, an online networking session tomorrow, 2.30 in um, Sydney, Canberra and Melbourne time. This is an opportunity for small group discussion of the ideas emerging from the symposium thus far. So it's an attempt, it will be an experiment, to try to, um, to have the morning tea discussions, but have them virtually. So um, I encourage you to attend as many of these as you can. If you haven't registered, simply email events at humanities.org.au. So thank you again, panelists, and um, uh, have a good evening, everybody. Bye.